we go back to Boston. And of course, we told everybody, all our friends, you know, like what we, what happened to us on the Akas. Now, that's, this time, all we knew was that we had a very close sighting. We, we had no memories of abductions at all. It was just this bizarre thing that chased us across the Allagash, or across Eagle Lake. And, but nobody believed us, you know. Uh, this was 1976, and even when you talked to supposedly tolerant artists, they just kind of uh, rejected us and ridiculed us for years afterwards. A, a year later, in 1977, the Boston Globe magazine, uh, I believe, had an article called UFOs Over New England. And, uh, and, and the, I think the whole magazine was dedicated to UFO sightings over all of New England. One thing that stuck with me in this article was that they mentioned that in Maine, between November of 1975 and November of 1976, they had over a thousand reported sightings in the state of Maine. And that 85% of those sightings were over Loring Air Force Base, which was a, a nuclear sack base about I think, 70 or 80 miles from where we were, which I thought was pretty strange. And um, <clears throat> years later, when uh, Raymond E. Fowler took on our case and, and documented it, I mentioned that to him. And what he said to me was, well, come on, Jim, you know why that is? And I said, no, I, I don't know why that is. And he said, because that's where they're supposed to come in, which I thought was a, an odd response. He said, that's where they're supposed to come in, yeah, come into our airspace over a strategic air command base. <laughs> <You know>. So, <clears throat> I thought that was a rather odd response. Doesn't sound like great. No. Uh, in 1978, I had just graduated from program in artistry with my certificate of mastery in June. And uh, another friend of ours came to the house and said, Jim, I'm renting a house in Calais, Maine, which is way up on the Canadian border, on the ocean. And I, he said, I'm renting a house for my family for the summer, and can you help me move in? And he had this old school bus, so it was all packed full of stuff. So I said, yeah, okay. So we drive up to Calais, Maine, and <coughs> excuse me, the day we moved in, it was raining. So we tracked all this mud into the house, after we got done, I said, geez, you know, maybe we should clean up a little bit, get some of the mud up off the rugs and whatever. And he said, okay, there's a broom closet on the second floor. Um, just go up there and grab some brooms and we'll, we'll do a little cleaning up. Well, it turned out, unbeknownst to us, that the owners of the house had a stairwell that went from this closet into the basement. And they had torn out the stairwell. But they left the top landing. So this the closet ran, it was a long, narrow closet that ran this way. And when I went to open the door, the door <clears throat> opened about eight inches and then it jammed on something. I thought, well, that's kind of weird. So I kind of got my head in through the opening and I looked around and I could see the, the landing. There was enough light that I could see the landing on this side of the closet. And there was a chair that had been it looked like it had fallen against the door. And that's what was keeping the door from open. There were hooks on the wall with clothing, clothing and boots and brooms. So I just thought it was a regular closet. So I thought, okay, I'll, I was a left hand back then, and I'll squeeze in and move the chair, and then I can get into the closet and, and get a, a broom. So I kind of arced myself in, and I got my left foot on the, the floor. And when I stepped back, I figured I'd step back, close the door, and move the chair. When I stepped back, there was nothing there. And I did a reverse somersault two stories into the basement. And when I landed, I was in a perfect sitting position. I uh, fractured uh, L, uh, L3, L4, L5, L6, uh, first and second sacral vertebra, ruptured all of those discs, and ran my spinal cord up into my brain from the impact of the fall. Well, I immediately go into shock. And I, at least I scream. When I hit 
I'll never forget this as long as I live. It, it sounded like somebody taking a broomstick and snapping it over their, their knee. And I knew, I was like, uh-oh, this is not good. So, um, but I, I yelled, and my friend heard me. And uh, when he heard me scream, he came in through another uh, bulkhead outside uh, stairwell. And when he saw what happened, he was like, oh my god. This is bad. So he ran to a house next door in the town. They didn't have a hospital. They had a cottage in Callas and one ambulance. And so he called the cottage and said, you have to send an ambulance here now. This friend, my friend just had a terrible accident and uh, he can't move and he can't walk. So uh, while he was next door, um, I suddenly realized that my feet were ice cold, it felt just like they were in ice water, and this feeling of coldness was coming up my legs fairly quickly. And I remember thinking, wow, what is going on here? And as soon as it hit my chest, um, it was like, just like walking through a door, or blinking. I suddenly was in this velvet black space. I couldn't see anything, there was no sense of space, or proportion, it was just velvet black. And I thought, wow, I must be dead. I think I'm dead now. I had no pain. I, I actually felt a little euphoric. And I thought, well, you know, I guess if I'm dead, um, this isn't so bad. Uh, at least I'm not in any pain. <clears throat> and then I noticed there was this light that hit my arms. I could see my, the light hitting my arms and this long penumbra going off into and disappearing into this blackness. And I was like, what the heck is that? So uh, I tried moving my head around, or at least feeling like I was moving my head around, and I got about this far, and behind me there was this huge white circle of light, brilliant, brilliant white light. But it wasn't, it was a weird kind of light again, because there were no rays coming out of it. It was, a, it was the only way I can describe it is if you have a sheet of black velvet and you cut a perfectly round circle in it and then put a big white light behind it. So you see the light in the circle, but it's not coming through. You don't see ray, I didn't see any rays or, or soft edge. It was just like as, as hard as a cookie cutter edge. And then I, I got a little frightened. I was like, whoa, what's that? And I noticed that this thing was rushing towards me. And I, I, I can't really describe like the scale of it, because there was nothing to compare the scale with. So I, I couldn't tell if this thing was like, say, you know, 10 feet in diameter and really close, or if it was like as big as the sun but really far away. I mean, I just couldn't tell, but I knew it was coming towards me. And I thought, whoa, what's going to happen now? And then all of a sudden, just like that, these two guys were looking down in my face, and one of them said, Welcome back. You're the luckiest son of a bitch in the world. And I was like, oh, what happened? And here it turned out that when I, when my friend went next door and called the cottage, they said to him, well, <clears throat> we're sorry, but the ambulance left like 10 or 15 minutes ago to go to a, a neighboring town to pick up a baby for adoption. They're, they're, they're not here. And he said, you reroute them now. So they said, okay, we'll do that. And they, they called the ambulance crew. And when the ambulance crew, crew got the call, they were literally right in front of the house. So they were like, oh, that's right here. And they pulled up the driveway. So they came in through the bulkhead again. And when they got to me, they said, oh, sorry, he's gone. No pulse, no heart rate, not breathing. I'm really sorry. And my friend said, he was alive when I came out to greet you. You bring him back right now. So one of them immediately started giving me mouth to mouth, and the other one went out to the ambulance and came back, and they patted me back. So I was very, very lucky. Uh, but I still couldn't move. <clears throat> and they took me to this cottage where they just kind of uh, filled me full of morphine because they didn't have the facilities to deal with this kind of injury. <clears throat> And uh, eventually, uh, another piece of luck was that the doctor who ran 
a cottage, knew a neurologist down at Mass General Hospital in Boston. So they, she called him, he was a, uh, was a really nice lady doctor, knew her stuff. And so um, they put me in an ambulance and gave me, a, they gave me this shot. And they said, you're going to go to sleep for a while. You're going to wake up in Boston. Well, I woke up in Augusta, which is six hours. And by the time we got to Boston, uh, they had already called ahead. They closed off Tobin Bridge, if any of you are familiar with Tobin Bridge. And we went across Tobin Bridge at 80 miles an hour. <laughs> And uh, they took me to, bed, to a Mass General. I was there for uh, a few weeks uh, recuperating. I had to learn how to walk all over again. I had to learn how to use my hands and my arm because I couldn't pick anything up. I tried to pick up a cup of coffee and just shake out of my hands. <laughs> and. Um, I kept me in the hospital for a few weeks, and then I eventually was able to start walking again. So um, I did get my ability to walk, but I had I was in a wheelchair most of the time for another few months. And then I went to crutches, and then I went to a back brace and a cane, and I had to use a cane for years. But eventually, I came back, and. Um, at the, this was uh, this was in June when this happened. So in the fall, uh, I had gotten a job working at the Museum School of Fine Arts, um, uh, running their ceramics department. And I was advised not to do that, but I I needed a job, and um, so I thought I'd give it more anyway. And I tried to stay with it, but it's an old saying in the clay biz: bad backs and clay don't mix. And after a little bit under a year, uh, I realized that this was, this was not going well. But then, uh, while that was going on, I had just got an invitation to teach as a visiting lecturer at UNH, uh, in Durham, New Hampshire, as a visiting professor for a year. One of their ceramics professors was going on sabbatical, so this was a really good opportunity for me. It was just an up and coming clay artist. So I took that job. While I kept working at the museum school, so I was driving back and forth from Boston to Durham, New Hampshire, uh, three times a week. And in 1979, not quite a year after the accident, I started having, um, well, I was having seizures, but I didn't know it. I started having weird feelings. Uh, half of my body would suddenly go in slack and I'd lose all my energy and it felt like my energy was being sucked out of me. It was a very weird set of symptoms. I'd uh, get my heart would suddenly speed up and slow down and become erratic. And I'd get these pains in my arms. I felt like I was having a heart attack. It's pretty bizarre. Um, so that went on for a long time. And every time I would feel one of these episodes, I'd go running to an emergency room saying, I think I'm having a heart attack. And they take me into an emergency and they do the test and they go, no, you, you didn't have a heart attack. We don't know what's wrong. You're probably a hypochondriac or maybe you had an anxiety attack. Uh, this went on for uh, four and a half years until 1983. I finally had a, a seizure in the Cooley Corner Cinema. Boston and wound up at Beth Israel Hospital where they finally diagnosed me as having uh, temporal limbic epilepsy. Now, in 1980, I had decided to visit some friends. Um, the, the temporal lobe is this long, long lobe right here. Here's your brain stem. And so what had happened was when I fell, uh, the impact just caused a, a lot of scarring from the tissue ripping where the, those two areas meet. And that was, that was what they finally diagnosed as causing the seizures. This is your limbic system, all of this right here. And you know, this controls a lot of things, a lot of parasympathetic functions, heart rate, 
temperature control of the body, a whole bunch of things. Uh, so that's what I was stuck with. And so I was undergoing treatment for years on this, but I'm getting ahead of myself. In 1980, I, I was visiting friends in uh, Sherman, Texas, which is about an hour north of Dallas. Uh, one of my friends was teaching at the college there. And uh, I went to bed one night and uh, went to sleep. And in the middle of the night, I heard this noise. And I woke up. And the foot of the, there was a window opposite the base of my bed. And it was summertime, and the window was open. And when I looked out the window, there was this humanoid type form standing outside the window, staring in at me. And uh, it was kind of a whitish color, uh, mottled. I couldn't really make out a lot of detail because it was dark at night. I thought, oh my God, there's a, there's a, a prowler out here. So I, I turned on the light and ran over to the window, nothing there. So I thought, wow, I must have been dreaming. So I went back to bed. I turned off the light switch, and as soon as I turned it off, I heard this scraping, scratching noise right next to my head on the pillow on the bed. Like somebody's scratching it with their finger. So I turned on the light, nothing. I didn't see anything, nothing at the window. I got a dream. It's one of these hypnogonic states. So I turned the light off. As soon as I turned the light off, scratch, 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 scratch. Turn the light on again. Sure. Nothing. So I thought, okay, the next time it's, I'm going to turn the light off, and if it, I hear the scratching again, I'm going to scratch back. Let's see what happens. <laughs> you know, I always make these fatal mistakes. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what happened. I turned the light off. Sure enough, as soon as I turned it off, the scratching noise. So I reach over with my hand. I go scratch, 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 and all of a sudden, it felt just like that, like something hitting me in the chest. And a second later, I could see the ceiling rushing towards me. I mean, it was that fast. And I had this feeling. Uh, I was it was a certain feeling that if I went through that ceiling, I was not coming back. That's that was the feeling that I had, and so I kind of like snapped my bean, I, almost like a rubber band or something, and the next thing I knew, I was back in bed. And uh, I left, the, I ran out of the bedroom and ran into my friend's bedroom, and I was like, whoa, look at the the window, and they were like, Jim, go back to bed, you know? <laughs> Uh, but for the rest of my stay there, I would not sleep. I could not sleep in that room. And that, that was in, uh, I think, June of 1980. Well, a year later, 1981, I had quit uh, my job at the Museum School of Fine Arts. One day, <clears throat> I was firing a kiln, and I passed out next to the kiln. And somebody, by sheer luck, I have, like, weird luck. Somebody happened to be standing next to me, and they caught me by the scruff of my shirt, because had they not, I would have fallen face first into the firebox. So after that occurrence, I decided, no, I'm not going to do this anymore. So I quit my job at uh, the museum school, and I took a job working for an art gallery in Baltimore, Maryland. It's called Marsons Limited. They had one of the largest collections of original Japanese woodblock prints and Chinese silk prints in North America. And it was one of these jobs where you uh, uh, pile $60,000 with the prints into your car and you drive somewhere and you do a show at one college and another for a couple of days and another show at a, a library somewhere and you just kind of bounce it. They set this itinerary for you. Well, my <clears throat> territory was the Southwest. I did all of Texas. Colorado, Utah, Nevada, uh, uh, New Mexico, and Southern California. So I was driving a lot, and in this old beat-up Volvo that already had 150,000 miles on it, and everywhere I went, it kept breaking down. I mean, everywhere. <clears throat> so anyway, in 81, I was in Ojai, California, doing a show at uh, Ventura College. I wore this three-piece suit, very clean looking guy, very handsome. And <clears throat> I was staying at a motel, 
And uh, while I was while I was there uh, driving around, uh, the the uh, headers on my motor got loose and it started making all this noise and I got stopped twice by the state police for excessive noise, engine no engine noise. It's, it's really loud. So they said, okay, third time the car gets towed and you, you know you pay a fine. So I thought, oh. So I went to the store and I bought a bunch of tools and I jacked the car up. I was, had it parked in this motel parking lot and it was early in the morning. And uh, I had the car jacked up and I was underneath the car trying to tighten the bolts for this header. And there were these two young boys playing tag out in the, the parking lot. One of the, one of the kids pushed his buddy into my car, the jack went out, and the car came down on my chest. So I'm laying in the car and my feet are going <laughs> And so the kids ran in, they got their dad, and their dad got a couple other dads, and they literally came out and picked the car up far enough and dragged me, dragged me out from under the car. And uh, they were like, wow, are you okay? And I was like, uh, I don't know, my chest hurts a little bit. And I had this nasty bruise on my chest. But I had to do a show that morning at Ventura College. So <clears throat> I just go in, I get cleaned up, and you know, I'm kind of walking like this a little bit. And I go to the college, and this, this elderly couple walks in. And they said, oh, uh, the man says, I was in, the, uh, in Japan right after the war, and while I was there, uh, he didn't say how he got a hold of it, but he said he got a hold of this roll of um, uh, Japanese woodblock prints. It was a long roll of paper with 15 prints on each side. And he wanted to sell them, and he asked me if I would give him an estimate of, tell him what they were, and give him an estimate of, of what they were worth. So I said, well, uh, why don't you roll it out on this rug, because I didn't have any table space. And he rolled this thing out on the rug, and when I bent over two of my ribs, popped out of my shirt, and I pass out face first on the floor. <laughs> so I wake up, and I'm in this bedroom like this. I had no idea where I was. And it turned out that this, this wonderful couple uh, took me to look. They packed up all my prints. They took me to the local hospital. They reset the ribs, taped me up, and, and I was in their home. And they said, you're going to be our guest here for the next week and a half. You really aren't going anywhere. Their names were uh, John and Bonnie Milroy. I'll never forget them. Really nice couple. They were uh, grieving, though, because their 18-year-old daughter had just died from a brain tumor. And uh, Ojai, California, if you've ever, never been there, is this amazing place. It's one of the citrus uh, valleys out in California, so the air smells like, like peach flowers and, and Lemon flowers. It's just incredible. And their their town mascot is the peacock. So like you'd be walking, you, if you walk down the town, Ojai, you like walk in a store and there's these peacocks walking around in the store. It's, it's totally nuts. You know, and I, I mean, I, this was after I had recovered. I, they, they took me downtown to show me this. And I was in the store and these peacocks come in and I'm like, wow, that is so cool. And when I walked out, there's two more peacocks, like, you know, peeing on this guy's hood of his car. <laughs> oh, that's not so cool. <laughs> but anyway, while I was staying with them, I was sleeping in their, their uh, deceased daughter's bedroom. And one night I was in bed, we all, uh, the three of us had gone to bed. And um, I, opposite the foot of my bed was a doorway, doorway into the room. And in the hallway, there was a hallway out there with a red nightlight. So uh, I went to bed. In the middle of the night, I hear this sound in my left ear. And I don't know if this, if any of you have ever heard this, but this is exactly how it sounded. It sounded like this. <laughs> My head and shoulders were up, my head was on the pillow, my shoulders were on the bed, but my legs were at a 45 degree angle and spread. And there was somebody doing something to my genitals. And I was like, what the heck? Because I could see their silhouette from the, the nightlight in the hallway. And this, this sound is still in my left ear, so I'm like, what's going on? And I, I'm kind of, and I couldn't move, but I could move my eyes. And I looked over and right next to my face. It was like 
there was a face there. But it was like if you take a piece of spandex and you stretch it across your face almost as if it's coming through some kind of fabric. That's what it looked like to me. And in front of it, on the side of the bed, was a tray of instruments. They looked like dental tools or surgery tools or something. I was absolutely terrified. And I was wide awake. And uh, then the next thing I knew, I woke up the next morning. I did not mention this at all to these poor people because they were, you know, freaked out enough from their, their daughter just passing away. So I never mentioned this. But I'll never forget that as long as I live. I was 81. Um, at that time, in 80 or 81, I, I had no connection to, the, to this UFO event in, on the Allegast. To me, you know, that was just a sighting with this weird little mystery about the fire, but we never really thought about that. And so I came back to Boston. Eventually, my back went out in uh, Texas, and I had to leave the prints out west and fly back to Boston, and I, and I quit that job. And I went, um, I was working for a friend of mine at an antique store downtown for a little while. Uh, 1983, I had the seizure. They took me to Beth Israel Hospital. They diagnosed me with temporal lobe epilepsy, and I was able to live on SSDI for uh, a few years. Um, and the whole time they were, I was going, I was, they were changing me on seizure medications, serious seizure medications, Tegretol. Depakote, Depakine, Carbamazepine, you name it, they had me on it, and they are really debilitating. So I was constantly going in and out, and then around, um, must have been around 87, I started having these nightmares where I'd, I'd be in bed in my apartment again in Boston, and I'd wake up in the middle of the night, and there'd be these figures around, the, around my bed. And I'd be like, who was in my room? I, 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 at first I thought it was one of my roommates, because I was living with roommates at the time, but it, it wasn't them. And I always had this intense feeling of malevolence. You know, I know many people, I've, I've talked to many, many, many abductees, experiencers, contactees, whatever you want to call yourselves. And many people have these really positive experiences, but uh, God, I wish mine were like that. But they were not. They were absolutely terrifying. Whenever I would um, feel this present, these things in the room, it, I had this sense that whatever it was, it was extremely malevolent. And so I got really paranoid. And it didn't happen every night, but it was happening, you know, once or twice a month. And I, it got to the point where I was so paranoid about what was going on that I was literally padlocking myself in my bedroom at night. And before I go to bed, I would go around the house and make sure that every window was closed and locked. Um, and my roommates were starting to wonder, well, you know, Jim's acting a little strange. <laughs> you know? And uh, so I went into the hospital. I had to, I, I, at one point eventually, they had me in the hospital because the doctors thought that I was having seizures while I was sleeping, that this, all this stuff going on with seizure activity. And um, it was true that when they did the EEG test, they did a number of uh, probe tests, uh, sleep deprived, and long-term um, <coughs> tests, that a, a lot of the activity I had uh, did occur while I was sleeping. So as far as they were concerned, I was having seizure hallucinations. But to me, they were absolutely real because the kind of seizures that I, that I normally had were more of a parasympathetic function, racing, erratic heartbeat, pain in my arms, uh, that sort of thing. It wasn't like these hallucinations of weird creatures in my bedroom uh, touching me at night and doing things to my genitals. <laughs> so, uh, this was uh, 1987, 88, I was in the hospital again. And one of the psychiatrists came out. I, they had me hooked up to some uh, an EEG unit, and they had my head in this thing, so I couldn't move it. And I asked the nurse if <clears throat> I could have something to read. So, of all things, she gives me Whitley Strieber's book. <laughs> so I'm, I look, I look at the cover. And I'm like, what is this? What is this? 
You know, and I'm looking at the stand, I'm like, I'm, it's like my heart started racing all over again. Um, I had this like, extreme anxiety attack. And um, I gave it back to him and said, I, I don't want to read this. And so a little while later, uh, one, of the, one of the clinic, the psychiatrist came in and said, geez, Jim, I, I heard you, you, you're, uh, you're having a little problem here. And I was like, what is going on here? You know, I, I thought they were playing games, you know, that they brought this thing in to kind of freak me out to see what it did to my, to my EEG reading. So I was like, why are you doing this to me? Why are you doing this to people? And he was like, wow, what, what are you talking about, Jim? Why are you, why are you saying this stuff? And I'm like, ah. And so uh, I said, well, I'm having these nightmares. I'm having these nightmares at night. Because to me, that's what they seem to be. I mean, that's the only thing I could describe them as. I still hadn't made the connection because in those days I didn't know anything about this stuff. I didn't know anything about missing time. I was, you know, I was just trying to, to heal and survive. So um, he, the doctor said, "Well, you know, tell us, tell me about your your nightmares." And um, this is uh, Whitney's book, so that's what I looked at. That told me made me go bonkers. And so, at first I was very reluctant to talk about them. I didn't want to talk about my nightmares. I mean, you know, everybody has nightmares. We all have nightmares. It's, you know, part and part, it's normal. And I didn't want to talk about them. Um, you know, the real issue was, was I was terrified of them, and that's why I didn't want to talk to them. But anyway, they, get, they finally got them out of me. They finally got me to talk about them. And uh, this one psych psychiatrist said, you know, Jim, I'm going to ask you a rather odd question, but I want you to just go with it. And I said, okay. And he said, have you ever seen a UFO? And I was like, well, as a matter of fact, yeah. And so I told him about the sighting we had on the Allegash. And he took it all down. He said, that's, that's very interesting. And so the next day, he left, and then comes back the next day, and he goes, you know, Jim, um, I, I had dinner about a week ago with a, a friend and colleague of mine who just happened to be John Mack from Harvard, who I had never heard of. But this guy knew John and had had dinner with him about a week before, I think he said. And John had just started doing his research with abductees. And he said, you know, my colleague is working with people that are having the same kind of nightmares that you're having. And I think there's a connection here between your nightmares and, and you seeing that UFO. And I said, well, I don't, I don't see what the connection could be. I mean, we just saw a UFO. We flew away, and that was the end of it. And he said, well, you know, I think you should talk to, I'm going to see if I can either get you to talk to John or somebody else. I want you to talk to somebody in the UFO field about your nightmares. And I was very reluctant to do it. I was like, you are, you know, you're nuts. This is crazy. Let's talk about seizures. And, uh, but he said, look, just indulge me. Please. And so uh, I, I left the hospital, and a couple of weeks later, uh, the, the psychiatrist called me up and he said, look, there's, a, there's a, a, a guy, a UFO investigator named Raymond Fowler. He's going to be in Waltham, which is a neighboring town a little outside of Boston. He's going to be at this UFO conference, and, and I already talked to him and told him that you're going to come and talk to him. And I was like, oh, what did you do that for? <laughs> I didn't want to go. But he, he said, look, please, do it for me. So I went and saw Ray. Um, this is Ray Fowler here on the left. At that time, he was, I think, head of uh, investigations for MUFON in the Northeast. Um, I had no idea who this person was, never heard of him. But uh, I met him at this conference, and, and I told him who I was. And he said, oh, yeah, I, I got the phone call from your, your doctor. Uh, let me hear this story. And he seemed totally uninterested. He was selling, he had a table with his books. And he, and, you know, he seemed like, oh, ho, ho, another one. And <clears throat> so I told him the sighting that we had on the Allegash. And during the, the uh, while I was describing this, I mentioned that one of the people that was on the canoe was my twin brother, Jack. And as soon as I said twin brother, he went, whoa, wait a minute, did you just say twin brother? I said, yeah, 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 I have an identical twin. So he said, okay. Packed up his books. He said, I want you to come over here, and I want to hear it all over again. So I said, okay. 
And we did that, <clears throat> and afterward he said, you know, um, this is very interesting. I want to talk to you some more, and I want to talk to some of my colleagues. One of his colleagues at the time was David Webb, who was also a MUFON investigator. And um, a few weeks went by, and he, he uh, called me back on the phone and said, um, we would like you to fill out a report, a, a formal MUFON report. Would you be willing to do that? And, and are you still in touch with these other guys that were on the, on the Allagash with you? And I said, yeah, of course. And so they send us this form to fill out and, and, and write a description. They wanted each of us to write a description of what we saw in the Allagash. This is the closest thing here from, uh, that we could pick out as to what we saw in the Allagash. So we filled out the forms and we sent them back to Ray. And a few weeks went by. This is well into 1988 now, almost 19, 1989. And he called back and said, I, I would like to do a formal investigation of this site. I think something, um, the other thing that caught, that put up a red flag for him was the miss, what he called missing time, the fire. He couldn't understand why the fire was burned out after only 20 minutes. So he asked if we, if we would allow him to do a formal investigation. We said yes. And so he, him and Dave Webb started this investigation. They, they actually called the ranger station up in uh, on the Allagash, Maine, to see if we actually made a report. And they said, yes, we remember these guys. And then uh, he called, uh, one of the people he called was my mother down in Allentown. My father had passed away in 81. But my mother was still living in the house that uh, Jack and I grew up in. And Ray called her on the phone and said, um, Oh hi, I'm so and so, um, and I know your, your sons. And um, they told me that um, they've you, they've experienced some strange things growing up in the house. And the strange thing was what we called Harry the Ghost. When we were small children, I, I put here Harry the Ghost or normal, not just for Steve. <laughs> it was my brother and I when we were five years old. When we were growing up in Allentown, uh, we had your typical, because in those days they called it poltergeist activity. Loud knockings and drumming sounds coming and singing from everywhere in the house, particularly during the night. We used to wake up in the middle of the night and see monsters in our bedroom and start screaming. And my father would come in and say, you're having nightmares, shut up and go back to bed. We had, uh, both Jack and I had a, extreme fear of closets and open windows. We could not sleep at night with the windows open or the closet doors open. Um, our entire family would have feelings, uh, particularly in the basement, of always being watched whenever we were in certain places of the house. Um, objects would mysteriously disappear, like in minutes, my mother would have a glass of water. One time my mother had a glass of water on the kitchen table and uh, she went out into the living room and while she was out in the living room, the glass literally exploded on the kitchen table. Um, when we were about uh, 15, Jack and I were home alone in the house and uh, one of these glowing spheres of light about the size of a basketball came through the kitchen window, um, through the kitchen, uh, through the living room, into our bedroom, kind of floated around in the bedroom for a few seconds, and then passed through the window, and disappeared. Um, that was a, a real event. And we used to hear this thing we, we still call the hum. I don't know if any of you hear the hum, but the hum, uh, which we still hear now, I still hear it now, but we still hear it there too, was this weird kind of, almost like a modulating electrical sound. It was a, there was a bass, frequency that would be like a constant. And on top of that was this modulating sound. It was almost musical. It would go and uh, Jack and I used to hear this all the time and we still do. And I still hear it where I live west of Boston and I'll wake up in the middle of the night and hear it the hum. And I'll go out and ask my wife and say, 
you, don't you hear that? And she goes, no, I don't hear anything, Jim. And I go, that's impossible. How could you not hear this? She goes, well, it's probably something electrical. I, I've given up trying to figure it out because I literally have gone on more than one occasion into the basement, turned the main off to the house so nothing is running, and I still hear it. And I can't, I can't target it. It sounds like it's coming from everywhere, and it's not, in, uh, it's not like it's inside my head. It's like, it's like coming from out there somewhere. Did you try recording? No, I've never tried to record it. You should. But um, I'll be up at Jack and Mary's. They live in southern Vermont. And we'll be sitting outside in their yard at night, and all three of us will hear it. And we'll say, oh, there's the hum. So that's another little weird thing. Well, uh, eventually Ray asked us if we would be willing to undergo hypnotic regression. So we said, OK. We'll do that. And he made all four of us promise. He said, well, I'm going to do you all in independent of one another. And I don't want you to talk to each other about what comes out of your particular regression sessions. And we said, OK, that makes sense. And over a period of two years, he uh, did probably, I think it was either 12 or 14 regression sessions um, of between Jack and Charlie, Chuck and I, and Jack's wife. And um, this is what came out of it. Uh, when I went in, and all of us, in fact, um, they, he had a professional hypnotist named Tony Constantino, who was very good. And they put us all uh, into these, independently, into a hypnotic, relaxed state. And they brought us back to that night on Eagle Lake so that we could hopefully remember what was going on. And what we remembered was uh, this, remembered, of course, uh, signaling this, this whatever it was with the flashlight. And then uh, they brought us to the point where Jack and I were looking back and this thing was almost on top of us. And I remembered under hypnosis this suddenly being in, enveloped in this <coughs> tube of light. It was all around us. And I remember uh, uh, literally being terrified. And, all, and I was watching Chuck Rack. And all of a sudden, Chuck Rack was gone. And I was like, oh my god, Chuck fell in the water. And then I had suddenly, had this, as soon as I had that thought, I had this feeling like my entire body was going to explode. It was, it was a really uncomfortable feeling of like pressure and that I was just going to explode. And Jack had the same sensation, so did Charlie. So uh, uh, they had difficulty with me with the regressions because um, I would become so agitated that they were afraid I was going to have seizures. And so they would have to keep bringing me out and then bringing me back down again and bringing me out and bringing me back down again. And, um, but I did remember some things. Uh, this is the first thing I remembered, was this face. This is a front view and side view. I'm not a, a very good illustrator. Uh, my brother Jack is the master artist. I'm just the potter. But I remember uh, seeing that face. And I remember uh, sitting on a bench inside of a room. Uh, that had this kind of diffused light, and I felt like I had um, uh, what do they call tunnel vision. Uh, I could see clearly right in front of me, but everything else on the peripheral vision was kind of blurred and fuzzy. And I felt like I was uh, drugged. And uh, I remember, and then I focused. I realized Jack was standing in the middle of this room, and there was this creature. I called them bugs that was about as tall as he was, maybe even just a little bit taller. They had very thin necks, almost pencil thin necks, and thin arms. They had like a, a grayish, bluish skin type suit, almost like a, a ski suit. And um, they were, Jack was naked to the waist, and then one of these creatures, whatever they were, had this wand that was about this long with a tiny little bulb on it. And he was, they were just, it was like they were giving him an exam. They were like 
opening his mouth and they were doing, sticking this thing in his mouth. They had another one that had a, a little blinking light on the end of it and they were looking in his eyes with this thing and he was just like, and I noticed that uh, along the wall there was a bench and Charlie and Chuck were sitting on this bench. Um, they were, I can't remember if they were half naked or totally naked and they were just staring in, in, the, in the space. And uh, I realized I was sitting just a little bit off on the same bench because they were over, over to my left. And I was watching these things. They were taking Jack's arm and they were articulating his limbs. And they were looking at his joints and they were um, examining the hair on his arms. It was just like he was under... I got the impression that we were like uh, polar bears that just got darted and were being checked out by the scientists. That's the way it felt. It was very clinical. There was no communication, uh, at least not at that point in time. And so um, eventually they had all of Jack's clothes off and they were checking his genitals. And then they led him off uh, down a short corridor into a, a doorway that was on the side of the corridor. And then they came for me. And I, and I was absolutely terrified. I was in a complete state of terror. And um, they did the same thing to me. And then they wanted me to walk off down this corridor, and I didn't want to go. And I balked. I was like, no, I'm not going to do this. And one of them took this rod, and they, they, they didn't jam it, but they pressed it into my rib cage, between my ribs, and it really hurt. And I, I didn't hear anything in my head, uh, but I had, I had a clear impression that if I didn't cooperate, I was going to be in trouble. So I followed these things in, and they... They put me into, uh, they took me in this room and they put me on a table. There was um, one standing at this side of the table, one of these creatures on this side of the table. Uh, I think there was either one or two behind me and there was another one at my feet. And um, they took uh, uh, skin samples, they took a sperm sample. And by, after that I was like, oh, that's it, I'm, I'm done with these things. And I, you know, I, I almost... I'm reluctant to say it, but I have to be honest with you. I really wanted to kill one of these things. I thought that maybe if I could kill one, I could create enough of a distraction to get out of it. Because my thinking was, you know, if they're doing this to me now, when you know, when's the dissection start? That's where my head was at. Um, and as soon as I had that thought, the, the instant I had that thought, one of these, the one that was, because I was going to grab the one that was standing next to me that close. As soon as I had that thought, that thing moved so fast, like 10 feet away. It was like in a blink of an eye. It was, you know, 8, 10 feet away. And then they came out with these things. They were like a concave hockey puck. It was a dark material. I don't know what it was. I don't think it was metal. It felt more like, um, like a slick rubber. And they put one on each one of my uh, uh, on the outside of my ank uh, my shins. And uh, to this day, I do not have hair that grows in those two spots. And when they did that, I couldn't move my legs at all. I was completely paralyzed. And, uh, and I, don't, I don't remember much more after that. Um, some of the stuff that came out from the other guys, uh, Charlie Fultz remembers being under some kind of device. He was naked on a, on a table. And they were using some kind of scanning device. This is what he drew them as looking at, looking down over him, he's, this head with these eyes. And he said that when they looked into his eyes, it was like they were pulling his mind out 